Okay, so um, let's see. Well, so you're all here to hear a, um, a, a teach-in, an introductory workshop, whatever you'd like to call it, on the Platypus project itself. The Platypus Affiliated Society organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old left, the 1920s to 1930s, the new left, 1960s to 1970s, and the post-political left from the 1980s to the 1990s. Um, and we do all this uh, to ask questions about the possibility for the um, reconstitution of an emancipatory left. What possibilities there might be for such a thing. Um, for example, one of the ways we do this is through journalism. And we have a new issue of our international open submission journal, the Platypus Review, that just came out this month. Um, issue 134. We've been doing it for quite some time. And you can visit platypus1917.org, uh, our website. That is platypus1917.org uh, to get involved in activities at a chapter near you. So thank you all for logging in tonight for this conversation. Um, I have remarks that should last about 20 minutes, I guess. Um, and then I'd like to have an in-depth conversation between the Platypus members in the audience and any newcomers eager to ask questions. But before we get underway, um, I wanted to break the ice by updating on some news that just happened in the world. So let me read my notes here. Um, this week, in another stunning display of corporate intersectionality, the toy company Hasbro announced that they are removing gendered language from their Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head line of toys. Many on the so-called left championed this as a real victory. Now we must refer to the classic toy as Potato Head because they found the masculine Mr. Potato Head to be especially offensive. So that just proves that even months after Trump lost the election, that the left is still panicked about dictators. I couldn't help myself. Um, all right. So this teaching, it's aimed semi-internally um, because it speaks to misgivings a platypus member might have. Originally, I wrote the bulk of these notes to remind myself about some of the basic points of our project. But also there's, there's something here for anyone sympathetic, uh, anyone wishing to understand the project's point of departure. Why does Platypus consider its work to be insufficient, uh, necessary, and humble? What is that work? Uh, these remarks are inspired by many things. I've, I've gone through past president's reports I've had various private conversations with other members uh, of which there are too many to cite. Um, and one of the many lessons you learn in Platypus is you get used to repeating yourself. And so these remarks, they are unoriginal to me, um, but I think every word is important to remind ourselves of. Okay, so this is the bulk of my presentation and then um, afterwards, we'll, we'll get going with some Q&A. All One week before his tragic and untimely assassination, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered an underappreciated speech at the National Cathedral in Washington, DC on March 31st, 1968. The name of the speech has posthumously been titled Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. In this speech, I mean, and it can be found on YouTube, it's a, it's a good speech. In that speech, uh, MLK invoked Washington Irving's short story about a man named Rip Van Winkle. Quote, the one thing that we usually remember about the story is that Rip Van Winkle slept 20 years. This is Martin Luther King 
writing them. But there is another point in that little story that is almost completely overlooked. And, and uh, Dr. King ends up recounting how Rip had gone to sleep during the reign of King George III and had woken up during the presidency of George Washington. When he woke up, quote, he was completely lost. He knew not who he was, end quote. Uh, MLK went on, quote, the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that Rip slept 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountain, a revolution was taking place that would change the course of history, and Rip knew nothing about it, end quote. Um, amidst the storm and stress of the late 1960s, Dr. King used this speech to warn of the dangers that come from being unprepared for one's moment. Should one fail to adequately grasp reality, one will also fail to change it, resulting in countless, countless missed opportunities. Quote, one of the great liabilities of life, this is MLK talking again, uh, is that they all too, is, is that all too many people find themselves living amid a great period of social change, and yet they fail to develop the new attitudes, the new mental responses that the new situation demands. They end up sleeping through a revolution. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that a great revolution is taking place in the world today. This was the late 1960s. Um, Consciously or not, in his imagery, uh, Dr. King was echoing uh, JFK, who not eight years earlier remarked on the world revolution, a world in turmoil. JFK said that we should not fear the 20th century, for this worldwide revolution, which we see all around us, is part of the original American revolution. This imagery of the American revolution um, was, was in the water in the 1960s. But what became of that possibility, of that revolution that they spoke of? In Platypus, we face the painful truth that Dr. King's warnings to stay awake amidst the changing reality fell on deaf ears. Increasingly little of the emancipatory desiderata remains in the consciousness of society today because any potential that prior generations of the left had has been squandered. Real opportunities for emancipation were missed, and these failures continue to cast a dark shadow over us today, clouding our vision and thus our ability to see and change reality. We live not with the gains of a successful revolution, but under the rubble of a failed one. Today, a counter-revolution is taking place that affects the course of history and the left knows nothing about it. We should reverse MLK's provocation and admit that we are sleeping through the counter-revolution. In Platypus, one of our many slogans is, the left is dead, long live the left. This slogan was first uttered in the context of a left on the ascent, the incipient um, millennial left. The year 2006 saw the formation not only of platypus, but also of the new students for a democratic society, the new SDS. The doors of many organizations were thrown open to a new generation of youthful leftists curious about the deep history of radical politics. Organizations like the now defunct International Socialist Organization, the ISO, continued their organizing of the anti-war movement, whose strength numbered in the tens of thousands. There was a semi-conscious break from the post-political left of the anti-globalization anarchism that characterized the 90s, and a return to Marxism to motivate the anti-imperialism. Centuries old questions frozen in time since the 1970s had begun to thaw. Um, just quickly, I'm going to make someone else a co-host just in case other people pop into the, uh, the waiting room. 
Okay, so why was the left pronounced dead, just as it seemed to many to be coming back to life? And dead according to what criterion? As Omer Hussein has written, quote, the left is dead, not simply, um, the left is dead is not simply a moral condemnation of the existing left for failing to meet abstract criteria of being healthy or alive. Rather, the left is dead according to its own history in relation to what it once was and what it imagined itself to be. Perhaps this is far from self-evident, at least for the left, end quote. Um, you can find that in, in Platypus Review issue 115. That was uh, Omer's article then. Um, so Platypus exists as a self-educational project to clarify what goals the historical left set for itself so long ago and all the ways that the contemporary left thwarts its own attempts to realize them. We trace our necessity all the way to Marx's call for a ruthless criticism of everything existing that is not afraid of its results. But we are one step removed from the ability to clarify the confusions of those who wish to change the world, like Marx was in position to do, because of our historical discontinuity with the object of Marx's critique. Our time is not that of Marx or of Lenin. No such mass movement conscious of itself exists today. Our unique approach to this absence is via negativa, our inheritance from the critical theory of Theodore Adorno, who in his words sought to project negatively the image of utopia. We in Platypus are showing the negative photograph of the struggle for socialism, the negative image of the critical consciousness of Marxism that is not present today. Today, we can only see what is missing. And with great difficulty, we must make what is absent present. We hope to inculcate a sensibility about, a sensibility, the ability to sense. Um, we hope to inculcate a sensibility of the usual ways that leftists avoid the political tasks of the struggle for socialism. Adorno argued that the only way to know what might be right is to know what is wrong. This is Platypus's approach to the left, to demonstrate and make palpable what is wrong with the left. What might be right about a potential future left can only be projected negatively. Following Marx and the best Marxists, who never called for anything positively, so much as grasp the existent as limited and symptomatic of what needs to be overcome. Platypus recognizes in the symptoms of the dead left all the evidence of regression. The dead left is in urgent need of overcoming. And the first step is admitting that the left today is not the solution, but the problem. Another slogan in Platypus is that we are a pre-political project, but pre-political in what sense? By contrast to us, the dead left assumes we live in a political moment where the task is to formulate a positive strategy and then implement it. For them, the only relationship between theory and practice is that we must do preparatory work to figure things out so we can then do something. Or the left assumes we live in a post-political moment where we have overcome the need for politics altogether. Uh, for example, um, for, the, for the evidence of the political moment type of approach, uh, Mike McNair of the Communist Party of Great Britain and the neo kautskyists that follow him over at Cosmonaut believe there could be a left unity project around a clear program. Um, just today I read an article where Cosmonaut said we should join the DSA around some Marxist program. But there is still a need to know what the program is for 
and the goals of the left, even in their basic formulation, have long since ceased to be self-evident. The left assumes too much and takes for granted answers that it cannot. Even the dead are not safe. The left today inappropriately begins with the question, what is to be done? While neglecting what conditions made it possible for Lenin to ask that question when he did. Platypus does not try to answer that question. Rather, we are historically required to point out that what has been done for the past 100 years or more has not worked to advance the cause of socialism. Now we, we often get charged with having a, a pre-World War I, second international centric approach. That owes itself to our sense that Marxism never survived and has not recovered beyond its crisis at that time uh, prior to World War I and then the revolutions that followed in the 1917 to 1919 period. Nothing else has advanced beyond that moment. Nothing else has overcome Marxism. The reading group syllabus and our pedagogy are not to offer a superior, more intelligent Marxism or much less a political endorsement of Marxism, um, but simply to present what Marxism actually was historically. Um, this is necessary to register its impossibility today. But if yesterday's solid footing has melted out from underneath us, Platypus aims to turn a break in continuity from a calamity into a chance to start anew. Platypus aims to leverage a liability into an asset. Like Archimedes searching for that one point at which he could slide a lever and use it to shift the entire world, Platypus aims to lift the weight of the dead left and to turn it into a force. We hope to turn the burdensome baggage of historical defeat from an obstacle into an opportunity. Rather than having the weight suppress possibility, we want to unbury ourselves from the crushing weight of the wreckage of the past. We hope to turn a post-political or prematurely political moment into a genuinely pre-political one. There is a liberatory quality in admitting how dire the situation is and how powerless and confused we really are. There's a liberatory quality to that. Because while the left is completely sidelined from the positions of power, we do not have to compromise on what Marxism really means or meant. We have room to breathe without the burden of immediately putting ourselves uh, in the line of fire and without being hysterical over every change in capitalism, without having to take a position. We can learn from Marxism precisely at a critical distance from it a historical distance, which is inevitable anyway. Because there is no existent self-conscious struggle for socialism, we have the luxury of contemplating what is really meant by a basic question like, what is socialism? The left today does not exist as a political force in the world. It only exists as a lockbox of ideas. And the, the left is dead partly because of its impotence to change the world, but more so than act, the left today educates. And Platypus believes this is a mendacious miseducation and an anti-leftism. And we seek to interrupt that. Uh, we do not abstain from participation on the left. Um, the question is not whether we are part of the left, but how we are how we participate, because we in Platypus are included in the death of the left. Um, we are part of what needs to be overcome. The difference is that Platypus has admitted it. We have become self-aware of the political impotence and the ideological incoherence of today, um, to which we are imminent. We are not 
offering a definition of what socialist politics is or should be, but only what it is not and cannot be. We have not arrived at the answer, but we are the only ones still posing the question. There is no available continuity with real historical Marxism, and that is the first truth that must be reckoned with if something like a mass socialist party is to be reconstituted. The new is the old in distress, wrote Adorno in 1942. Only he who recognizes that the new is the same old thing will be of service to whatever is different. Marxism was the imminent dialectical critique of socialism. Absent socialism, Marxism also does not exist. There is only a suspect pantomiming of Marxism, a pseudo-Marxism, as the Spartacists might put it. Um, and, and that Platypus also risks doing that. Platypus members constantly face the pressures of a false or a premature positivity. One risks doing Platypus without understanding why. One risks hosting the conversation, uh, seeing the results, and wanting more in a confused sort of way. Um, I hear all the time um, comments like, why do we have to keep hearing from the dead left? We have read enough about the revisionist dispute to know how to orient ourselves towards Trump or towards Biden. Let's just go be a better left. I hear things like that all the time. We will constantly frustrate our, our audience, of course, but most of all ourselves. Every time the left reacts to a change in capitalist politics, Platypus reinscribes its raison d'etre to make the death of the left felt. And every time Platypus will experience the blowback of this. Uh, if you're in Platypus long enough, you will experience what I have taken to calling the Groundhog Day effect, where you find the same teachable conversations playing out in repetition. You just explained a concept to someone yesterday, and then that same question comes up again today, just someone different is ask asking it. New students will have the same hangups as you yourself did years ago and might still have. Um, even longtime members can find themselves repeating these leftist dogmatisms and thought taboos that they were sure they unlearned. With every new change in capitalist politics, you have to recommit to the basics. As a teacher, get used to repeating yourself ad nauseum. As a student, never think you have nothing more to learn. The point of Platypus, and this is where you get the other half of the, the title for this teaching, feeling the death of the left, um, and the first half sleeping through the counter revolution. The point of Platypus is to shake people awake. You must feel the weight of the death of the left. You must learn to measure the depth of the problem. As bad as you think it might be, it's probably worse. The zombie left has learned a hundred years worth of comforting lies to tell itself, to avoid thinking about how much work there really is to be done. Platypus, and this is why I say our, our project is um, necessary but insufficient. Platypus cannot reconstitute the left by itself, politically and socially but it can dissolve the ideological obstacles and work to interrupt the miseducation preventing the formation of a future left. Platypus exists to produce a felt frustration, a productive and critical resentment with the situation that is. We are the only ones who are willing to feel that without avoiding or denying that there is a real problem a real contradiction. The left have become experts in dodging while platypus forces that confrontation. 
Platypus also hopes to drain the swamp or to prevent young leftists from being recruited to these existing organizations where they would inevitably burn out. Platypus is a more liminal environment where students can entertain these ideas without feeling the pressure to immediately put them into practice. Students can express their curiosity about Marxism without being burned out forever on it. The dead left will chew you up and spit you out, and it will never take responsibility for ruining your best years of mental and physical capacity. For the last hundred years, all victims have either died as bright-eyed leftists failing to understand why they are failing, or they lived long enough to resign themselves to the status quo and become Democrats. We live, um, wrote James Baldwin in 1962, in the time when words are mostly used to cover the sleeper, not to wake him up. The left over the course of a century has dozed off under its warm blanketing of self-deceptions. Whereas Rip Van Winkle's long sleep only resulted in the misfortune that he was barred from participating in a revolution that nevertheless transpired without him, we, by contrast, can be sure that our collective failure to wake from this nightmarish counter-revolution would indefinitely adjourn the possibility of revolution somewhere over the horizon and would prevent the light of freedom from being glimpsed ever again. Okay, so that was my remarks. Um, I hope I pleased Mike. I'm up on your big screen I saw on Facebook. You, you posted a pretty picture of me. Um, that's all I have for opening remarks. Now, I really do want to have a discussion. Um, bounce it around to the different platypus members. Bounce it around to the people who are not platypus members here, if there are any. Um, and, and just start, you know, with questions. What, what, what do you have on your mind? When I uh, read the title of the speech and I was thinking it was gonna be about um, this uh, way in which platypus might be, um, the, the specific forms in which platypus allows us to feel the death of the left. So you're you, you were talking about before about how um, we uh, want to, um, cultivate, I guess, this, uh, a kind of frustrated sentiment, um, a productive uh, frustration with the left. And this, um, is this, I guess, the, the practical task, immediate task of platypus? Is that something that is done through panels and coffee breaks and stuff like that? Like what kind of, um, how do you see that taking um, place in, in platypus exactly? Because to, I, I think there are some people that would say that, well, the um, slogan, the left is dead, is actually a way to um, ignore feeling the death of the left, for example. Uh, so how does that actually come to the fore? Let me make sure I heard you correctly. Are you asking, um how exactly platypus does our work through the activities that we take up? Are, are you asking um, how the tripod works and that kind of thing? How the, yeah, how the uh, death of the left has actually come to be felt rather than, um, yeah. What, what do uh, others think? For me, it's, it, it's, it's the importance of the tripod structure that precisely allows for this. Uh, for a long while, I was just doing the reading group 
And if you just do the reading group, then yeah, you can ignore it. You know, you can just sort of discuss historical Marxism and it becomes a bit of an academic exercise at worst, you know. At best, maybe you sort of pointing to um, an absence. But even in pointing to that absence, you're not you're not sort of really confronting it because you can just even then you can become sort of comfortable with that solution, with that um, uh, conclusion, because you can just sort of with a hand wave go. The left is dead. It's absent today. Let's discuss what it was and have done with it. Whereas with the tripod structure, you're actively engaging the left. And, and, and that's that's massively, massively important. Um, I forget when it was I did my last one. Time seems to have disappeared in lockdown. Uh, but we did, um, there was two in Manchester around the housing crisis. And then I was moderating the um, the Marxism and liberalism one. That was it. Um, and I haven't done any for a while now. And I find myself sort of slipping back into that lethargy a little bit. And it's risky. It's risky. Uh, this is why Platypus really touts this this um, this tripod structure. If you're constantly confronted with this, and the fact that um, in its deadness, it's kind of zombified. It's like you know, it's like a puppet on strings sort of thing, um, a pure masquerade. Uh, unless you're confronting that, yeah, I suppose it it can feel like it's just a way of eliding it. So that for me, that's where the tripod structure comes in. I'm throwing up on the screen just for the sake of posterity whenever this recording goes up somewhere. What would, do we mean when we say the platypus tripod? I made this little graphic a few years ago um, based on some other teachings I'd heard um, past presidents give. Um, the primary Marxist reading group that we all have done, if you remember, um, if you only are going through the reading group and you're only talking about the historical left, you can start to you can start to f have those worries of smartism and and feeling like you're you know so well versed in what Marxism was and you must have everything figured out. Why don't you just go out and be the better Marxist? And that starts to produce the worries of the the intellectual coterie I, I've heard people throw around lately of just being the Marxists who know better. And that would be a, a tragic misunderstanding of what Platypus is trying to do. We're not trying to um, say we have it all figured out. In fact, we're trying to draw attention to how, how opaque the present is and how much confusion there is and how much we don't really know because we're so far removed in history from when all this stuff was alive and well. Um, and so that's why the, the public fora is so important is it it draws you back into the contemporary left and it draws you back into new students also um how how young people are coming up and experiencing this for the first time um that's why i, I put that little blurb in my remarks about uh you hear the same confusions over again just with different people um that should tell you something that these things are spontaneously reproduced generation after generation and, and that you keep hearing the same hangups and confusions is a sign that there's still work to be done. One of the reasons why engaging with the self-avowed left is actually a, a potential, um, I don't want to say solution, but a, as a, a, a defense against falling into an intellectual coterie is you realize you can't just like say the correct Marx packet passage at them, right? Like, very, you know, this must have been many years ago, but I remember bringing Marx's uh, letter to Ruga to like a communist party meeting and like forcing them to try to read it out loud, you know, like to be like, oh, look, isn't communism contradictory? It's infected by its opposite private property. And they were like, okay. You know, it's like, I can't just be like, doesn't Marx say this? Doesn't Lenin say this? Because it's not, a, you know, like that would be, better if that was the problem was that people are like bad readers or something. And I feel like that impression comes out in the reading group because people will come to the reading group and they go, well, I was taught this material wrong, of course, but that's only like the coming to wisdom. 
And then the next, like everything that happens in the reading group is like a coming to wisdom. That doesn't solve things. It's not like, oh, well now we know the real shit. This is the real shit. It's rather like, oh, okay. And so then why is this the case that there's a certain way in which people are reading? And then that's like a, oh, okay. That's, that's a feeling like that, that's kind of how we also even, you know, I don't know the experience of everybody listening right now of a platypus reading group, but we don't teach it in like a, this is the positive program sense. We go like, this is how they thought. And oftentimes it's like, and we actually can't proceed with this. I can't proceed with Lenin's imperialism pamphlet or state revolution as some of you are reading this coming week. I can't just be like, oh yeah, this is it. Anyways. I was done with my comments. <laughs> Somebody else wanted to say something. Luke asked something in the chat box, by the way. Uh, Luke is busy at work, I suppose, but it says, what is one concept you've experienced yourself needing to repeatedly relearn? Mm. Does anyone have something that immediately comes to mind? I, for me personally, um, regression comes to mind. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any more for us? Well, I guess it kind of goes to what Danny was what what Danny was saying, which is that like it can be taken for granted that there's been like a regression of the left, but I think perhaps what can be so confusing is that regression also refers to a state of like society, like society itself experiences regression, but that the left is similarly subjected to that that the left is itself like part and parcel of that regression or a symptom of regression. And that the left is not innocuous from regression, but that we've sort of, you know, to steal Spencer's wording, um, we've become sunken in that regression. It's become second nature to us. Whereas before it was something that we were supposed to um, we were supposed to feel, we were supposed to be conscious of and, and recognize as a way out. So I think that that's, that's like a, a concept I can feel sometimes slipping away from me when I get too into the reading group, like that regression exists. And I always find myself having to like pull myself back in with it. That's another phrase you might hear some platypus members say, maybe sometimes in unfortunately a, a polemical manner. Um, uh, Democrats, nothing but Democrats kind of phrase. This is something. And I, I've been thinking about it recently just because I, I had to start preparing remarks for something. Um, I, well, one, it, it made me sort of realize every time that, well, Republicans are also. Democrats, at least in terms of what's meant by the phrase, meaning it's not like, uh, well, the problem with the left is they vote for the Democrats, but rather it, it actually goes to our namesake. I brought this up in my um, recent interview as well, that Republicans and Democrats, they constitute how people think of left and right today. I know I'm giving a US centric example, but I'm, I'm sure people can follow what the point I'm making. And that platypus as a name was supposed to mean that if a left was to return today, it might be like a platypus was to the first, you know, British naturalists that came across the platypus where it kind of didn't make sense to them. And so likewise, rather than a left being like a split from the Democrats or what, you know, something else that people have flirted with that maybe like it's coming out of the Republicans, like it's the Trump and proletariat. You can find this um, from 2015, that article. Right, because he started to talk about, you know, quote unquote left things. And so people are like, okay, I guess that's where the left is. It's rather that a left really would cut across in a way, meaning it would actually constitute politics as it is right now in a different way. And that might even be the challenge, meaning you might have competing 
political continuums. It might be like the Democrats and Republicans say, this is what politics is. And the left would make a case that, no, in fact, it's this, it's something different. And it might even cut across all the different parties as well as people who are apolitical. So I'll give you an example in history. You know, it, it, it's actually kind of funny how something like class is naturalized today because it used to be the case in Marx's time that class society was a provocative concept because the liberals were like, oh, there are poor people. There are certainly people that work for other people. But we don't live in a class society because they knew that that would mean bourgeois society had been like undermined. That would be like uh, an offense right, of, of bourgeois society. Whereas today it's like, yeah, you're in all these different classes. It's like middle class work. Anyways, so my point being that what Marx and Engels did is they actually followed through on a sort of provocative way in which society was politicized as class society. There was even an ought to it. It ought to be the case that the explanation of all these irrationalities is that we live in a class society, because at least that would imply that there's something that it was pointing towards, right, socialism. And so likewise, today, like, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's either people are latching on to the Democrats, they latch on to their, you know, or people complain, uh, you're taking up the inverted view of the Democrats, right? It's, it's anti-woke, which is also a capitulation to kind of Republican Democrats. My point is that the left actually, I think very likely would politicize society in a different way. And that might even be the point of contention. So rather than being the extreme of any of these sides, it would be altogether something like, and that would, that would be the argument kind of, like at least ideologically, that argument is too anodyne for work. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Democrats, nothing but Democrats. That is something I've revisited and learned more about, you know, just thinking about it. I don't know, walking down the street and thinking about these things I've learned in Platypus and I'm like, oh, Maybe, you know, it's deeper than I thought. And, and just to add to Danny's point about Democrats, nothing but Democrats. One thing that I, I don't know why I didn't, um, I guess I kind of thought I knew it when I was more of a, a libertarian right wing type um, before I ever encountered Platypus, that obviously the, the, powers that be that govern the status quo, they're actually in agreement a lot of the time. I guess I would have probably said something like that, but but that's really come home to me um, in a more obvious way during the last, I don't know, a couple of years, the last, the, the tail end of the Trump administration, when it's really clear just how much the Republicans and the Democrats agree on that. that well, and how much Trump agrees with them. Like that's actually the more ideological aspect, which is Really, if you consider policy, Trump, the Republicans, and the Democrats, they probably agree like 98% of the time or 99% of the time. So that really shows the degree to which things are forced. It's not like Trump, had, like they want to they pose it as if it's an opposite program, right? Because that actually helps the powers that be. They give a false choice. That's right. We all read the Max Horkheimer, the authoritarian state. It's like a necessary aspect of stabilizing capitalism is you have like an opposition, right? You have the loyal opposition and it's like a pseudo loyal opposition. And then that's, that's what stabilizes things. Mm -hmm. And the, the rhetoric from time to time will, will vary. Um, but in, in all, for all, for all intents and purposes, the actions are the exact same in governing the the capitalist apparatus and um and that i don't know I, I don't know why it took me so long to learn that lesson but that's something i'm i keep trying to repeatedly relearn the other thing i just thought of reminds me of luke's clarification of emilio's question and i um, getting hung up on the first half of the slogan the left is dead and not remembering the second half long live the left that the intent is not to just write off the existing left. Um, the intent is to reconstitute the exist or the, an emancipatory left. Um, I, I find myself less now that I've had some, some time under my belt, but when I first joined Platypus, I was very quick to just get angry and frustrated and 
argue with the left and get into all these social media tussles and my, I see Mike I see Mike laughing I've seen a few from him too um I, I I found myself trying to argue just oh I, I know this stuff better than you do but that's at the end that's not really what it comes down to um is is just being smarter than than the left to say as well just doing reading group gets you into that mindset for sure. You know, you can just understand it better or that you get it better. I, I like I still suffer from that. I still I, I mean part of it's cathartic. Part of it for me is like I'm lashing out at both what I was and what is still in there somewhere yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. You know, it's like self-directed. Um, but it's unproductive. Um, so yeah, there's a cat about to invade. So there we go. I'm gonna mute. No, but what so <laughs> going to the reading group only has that effect um actually going to coffee breaks and and being well not during the COVID era but being on campus among new students who don't know me and i have to be very sensitive to how i approach them and which of their pressure points i push on that is the best remedy i think is is just having me take a deep breath and how can i teach these students how can i take how can I meet them where they are at and approach the left, you know, in vocabulary that they're using um, that, I don't know. I find, I find new students, a continual source of a font of, of, of goodwill and good vibes for me. I'm just saying names I don't recognize. Um, I think I know everyone except Mary and Charles. Um, how, who, how did you hear about this session? Are you affiliated with Platypus at all? I guess I can go first. Um, this is Mary. Um, so uh, ever since um, I first um, started going to college and I saw you know posters for the Platypus um, around campus, I was always thinking of maybe attending one of the sessions. Um, and um, so I ended up going on the email list for the platypus and I saw there was a teach in this week and I figured why not, so. What what um, part of the, are you in America? Oh yes, I'm sorry. I'm a, a student here at George Mason University in Virginia. Oh, okay, right on. Always good to meet new contacts. Um, uh, one thing I, I find it's important to stress um, no one has to have any prior experience on the left. You don't even have to identify as a leftist to come to these sorts of things and get something out of them. When I used to run a chapter in Knoxville, we had a lot of conservative people that came, people in uh, the Young Americans for Freedom. And they were like, wow, this is, this is interesting stuff. I didn't know that the left used to be so different than, than they are today. Um, and, uh, and I think we had a little bit of that at George Mason, didn't we, Justin and Amelia? We had some people from Young Americans for Liberty come by. They were sometimes better participants than people who had identified with the left for years. <laughs> yeah, I, I find the people that on the left that take platypus seriously are the ones that are already beginning to feel that frustration. You know, they're living in and amongst the left and they're like, why is this not going where I think it should go? Why are they not, you know, winning? Why, why are we not tired of winning yet? Um, and, and maybe they've been kicked out of a leftist organization or they've just gotten a lot of blowback for trying to think critically about what they're engaged in. That's when they come to Platypus and they get something out of it because they feel like, hey, this isn't making a whole lot of sense. Can you help me explain what's happening to me? What's happening in society today? Um, and I find that those are the best conversations when people are like, I don't really know, let's let's talk about it. Um, help me work through the, some of the basics. And um, so stick around, stick around, Mary. Yeah, um, I'm Charles and yeah, I think I like was, is our, uh, I heard about this through there's a guy at George Mason, I'm also a student at George Mason, who was in with the college Republicans. I think he was even the president at one point. And he uh, 
I liked your organization on Facebook or something. And so that's how I heard about it. And I signed up for it a while ago and I just decided uh, to finally come to a meeting. So glad to have two people from Mason, Northern Virginia. Let's go. <laughs> for sure. Glad you could stop by. I'm glad that the email list is reaching people. Was the, having heard these remarks, um, I assume you probably didn't know too much about Platypus before you came. What are what are your some uh, first impressions? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm still trying to like figure out exactly where, because you know, like I said, I'm not really a leftist, but I'm like where you guys would fall, I guess, among all the different like left groups that I'm thinking of, like you know your DSA people, your Sanders people, your like tankies, you know where. So I guess I'm still trying to like figure out like, you know, all that. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> I guess, I, you know, if I was going to answer that question, I'd say that it's tough to say that we fall among them at all. Um, but at the same time that we kind of feel at home among them in a way that we kind of recognize ourselves as being um, the symptoms of sort of the fallout of the destruction of the left in, in history through the 20th century. And that we have to recognize those groups and thus also ourselves as being sort of among them as being symptoms of a kind of a fractured left or of a, a fractured historical legacy that doesn't really exist anymore. So I guess one way that um, one of the founders of Platypus puts it is that you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that's sort of like what we kind of, or at least I, people in Platypus try to understand the modern left as. So all these people kind of represent the different, different puzzle pieces of the left that don't exactly come together when they add up. And so that there's something missing there. And we are, we are I would say we are left centric in our approach um, and, and we are left centric because there are even the people claiming to be on the left today, they still have some kind of echo of some kind of memory of what the left used to stand for. And we want to take that seriously. Whereas the right, they never had to, you know, uphold some of these same values. They never had to claim that they were, you know, for radical change or, or anything like that. Um, that's not part of the definition of the right. And we're trying to see, you know, what the left is claiming to be for, and do they really live up to, to that threshold? You know, one of the difficulties as well is uh, just the complete emptying of what used to be understood by political. And so the, the kind of maybe, you know, immediate or superficial way in which Platypus would appear is like, oh, these people are Trotskyists because you would come to like, I don't know, a Platypus reading group and we read Trotsky last week and reading, we're reading Lenin. And so people think of positions along the lines of like, who are you reading? Right, who are you, you know, if you write an essay, who are you quoting? Like this is someone's position and therefore this is someone's politics. So I remember having a coffee break probably last year at this time um, and someone was like, oh, what's your position on Iran? And what they meant is like, are you like, for Iran or are you like in, you know, against uh, US imperialism or something? And I was kind of like, well, like this is one of the issues today which is that politics is reduced to someone's like opinion. And that's not because it's not like a thought mistake. That's actually a real reflection of the liquidation of any political forms. But the only thing that it really kind of immediately can appear as is as someone's opinion. So that's why it would appear like that's kind of the place that we, we fall around. But you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, we read these texts, for example, we, we really read the texts, um, and this is the point that Ethan's been making, in order to actually educate people and prepare them on engaging with the existing left. I mean, if you're going to go to the DSA right now, I mean, you know, I saw there's, um, I'm in a Philadelphia, you know, they have like reading groups and stuff. Like, you know, you're going to want to be prepared with Marx, or I don't know if they read Trotsky, but maybe Michael Harrington. Um, you know, maybe some Kautsky they might be reading. And so part of the reading group is kind of giving people the most, uh, to the best of our ability, to the best of our ability, this is the ideal, 
kind of the unfiltered, unadulterated, this is what Marxism was. This is what Marxism was as a question, not as a, this is the truth, accept it. Charles, if you come to the reading group, you have to accept it. You're not leaving until you accept Lenin's, you know, uh, correctness. This is what it was. And what does that mean that this is what it was and you go out in the world and you interact with the left and they give a different interpretation of Lenin. That's not an arbitrary thing. Obviously some people have, you know, just misread things, but I don't think this problem can be reduced to a misreading. And I think it's a real historical phenomena of why Lenin gets used in a certain way, why Marx gets used in a certain way, why whomever that we read gets used in a certain way. And that's an insight into history that is uh, much deeper and much uh, longer going back than any of us on the call right now, right? It's like a hundred year history. And so the texts are kind of like the doorway into this. Like when you show up and you, you listen to one of our panels, I don't know, we'll do a panel on like, what is political party for the left? And you have a Trotskyist there and they say, it's the subjective factor and it's revolutionary leadership. Okay, well, you've read in the Platypus reading group the transitional program, so you know what they're saying. And then you hear someone who's like more neo Kapsky and you, they're talking about like, you know, revolutionary patience. And it's like, okay, in the reading group, you've read, you know, the three Kapsky readings that everybody does. So you're at least like, know what's happening. You know, this, these parts of the historical left that people are reaching for. And then, yeah, go ahead. And there's always sure. a question of why they're reaching for it. Um, we, we, we say a lot in Platypus that one's account of history is also one's account of the present. And we're, we're always trying to figure out why the history of the left is such a touchstone for leftists of all stripes um, to justify present practices. Like, why do you need to read State and Revolution by Lenin to justify, you know, joining a labor union? Why do you need to read like uh, Marx's address to the Communist League to join the DSA? There's, there's, there's a real question there. Um, and, and we're trying to figure out why these texts are returned to over and over and over again um, today, long after the conditions that made these readings possible, long after those conditions are gone. So actually, um, I also had like a question. So you guys apparently, you know, obviously you guys read a lot. Do you guys ever read, I guess, like what would be more modern people like, uh, and I, whether these are really leftists or not, but like Deleuze and Guattari or like Mark Fisher, do you ever engage with like uh, writers like that? We actually just had a whole, um, our president just went on a, uh, uh, did an interview, kind of a hostile interview did slash debate about Mark Fisher. Oh. Yeah, we do try to, we do actually read those people as part of like our engagement with the broader left, because obviously the left today is very focused on those figures. But again, like we try to understand what it is that those people represent in terms of the history of the left. Like, what are they, where are they getting their ideas? What, you know, what, what um what parts do they have right what parts do they have wrong in what ways do they try to re either recapture or overcome marxism this is something that um i said to a a, a good friend of mine in a discussion a, co a couple of weeks ago um it was all you know with with this guy it was very good natured he's not quite on board with platypus but you know there, were, there weren't any cross words or anything he was struggling to understand uh why we talk in terms of like the these historical figures why are we talking about um say marx and hegel and, and theory and things like that why do we do this he, his argument was surely you can see that this is not going to engage ordinary people uh, and i took this as an opportunity just to try and restate my own uh, interpretation of what platypus is about and i'm i'm sorry if this is just treading over ground that has already been gone over today but it, it seemed to help uh, so I said, Platypus exists to engage with the left, not ordinary working class people, which isn't to say they're mutually exclusive, of course, uh, because the biggest ideological obstacles are in the left. We do not claim to be Marxists. We do not to claim to be the true left or to be ideologically pure. I am not a Marxist. There is no Marxism today. Marxist politics is dead. All we do, all we do is measure today's so-called left 
against the historical Marxist left. That's it. If in doing this, we show that today's left is paltry and useless, uh, then so be it. Take that as a challenge, you know, take that. That's the whole via negativa thing, as I understand it. Um, we don't claim any kind of purity or to know better. We only claim to be able to show what the left really was a century ago. We don't advance any theories. We don't advance any tactics. We don't claim to know. We don't claim uh, to, the, to know the road to the revolution better than anyone else, because we definitely don't. We're certainly not an academic sect. Academic Marxism itself is a symptom of the degradation and regression of Marxism. But Marxism did have intellectual roots. It was the end point of German philosophy, to put it very basically, uh, reaching the conclusion that the intellectual and practical sides of society presently in opposition must come together. Humanity must come to exist for itself, but all bets are off. It might not even be possible anymore. All we claim is that today's left itself has become an obstacle to this, to even trying to engage in mass proletarian politics again. We're self-consciously pre-political in that sense. So I'm sorry if that trod over old ground, but it seemed to help the people who read it. I um I wanted to add, oh, where's the, there's the, okay. So the primary reading group syllabus, um, I would say it's humble and it's only the very bare bones account of what you you might ought to read if you are trying to learn about the left. Um, the syllabus has only what can't afford to be scrapped, really. And and what are what is the metric we're using to decide what can't be scrapped? Well, we get our syllabus, 99% of it at least, from what the left itself reads and quotes and references and and you know talks about a lot. Why would we read the transitional program? Because a lot of people out there on the left read it. Anything beyond the syllabus still should be read. And, and we're never going to tell someone not to go read something, not to pursue what's interested to them. Um, I would say we would push that into another medium. We would like to have an interview or a panel, let's say, on what the left talks about. Mark Fisher, for example, we have had um, interventions on the left about Mark Fisher, Deleuze, Guattari. Guattari. Um, we also could do coffee breaks or teach-ins on that as a campus building, a milieu build, building kind of thing. Um, that would be where we take seriously anything else that doesn't fit into the syllabus. What uh, maybe a lot of people out there like Slavoj Žižek, or or something we, we could do activity on that we could read Zizek together um, and have a productive conversation but we would always be trying to measure it against the that same yardstick of, of the historical left of of what we read in the reading group and see how it stacks up are they asking some of the same questions or are they leaving something out you know what are they not saying how are they how are they more evidence of the of the absence of, of socialism today. Um, that's what we'd always be asking the question of. I, I'm just going to put my cards on the table. I'm a little bit more friendly to Mark Fisher than even our president might be, Ephraim. I, I think there's a lot to be learned from Mark Fisher, but um, and not to say that Ephraim did not think that as well, but he might have been a little bit more sour on, on Mark Fisher's reception today. Um, and so there's a disagreement. There's disagreement among Platypus members about what is relevant and what is more interesting. And, and that's that's helpful. That's productive. That's allowed. Um, we are, the last thing I'll say is we are student centric and we are member centric. We want to do whatever the newest members of Platypus are interested in. And we want to take up whatever they're wanting to take up. We're not trying to preordain what are the good conversations and what are the bad ones? Um, might be more difficult to have a conversation on some, some things. So I'm trying desperately to plan a panel on media and the left, like social media and the left. Why the hell are so many people making memes and podcasts about socialism? And what does that tell us? That's a hard panel to make work. We're trying and uh, it's because there are so many newer members um, interested in that. I think Clay is here with me too. He, he could he could speak more about that. Um, 
so yeah, we, we would read whatever uh, people want to read as long as we, 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 we would read it in a disciplined way. Ethan, I joined slightly late, so let me know if I'm being redundant. But of course, you know, as we hear with the left today, it's reduced to the struggle against oppression. And I think Chris points out where people have struggled against oppression at all times, at all places, prior to the existence of a left, or it's reduced to working class politics, which means better wages, health care, et cetera. And so I'm wondering if you would elaborate a little bit on Platypus's attempt to restore the memory of the left as, you know, Kolakowski's definition, this utopian impulse, a critical self-consciousness, et cetera. Because oftentimes you said you're encouraged by speaking with younger people. I'm not, with the exception of a very few, because it's reduced to, to some type of self-identity with a, with a class, right? Or with an oppressed uh, group, et cetera. So it precisely loses the utopian and the self-critical uh, character, as it were. So any thoughts on that, how to elaborate, et cetera? Well, before Ethan says anything, I wanted to say that, it, you know, I, we had um, the right also a lot of times understands itself as the, the struggle against oppression. Mm -hmm. I mean, we must always remember that the Nazis believed that the German people were being oppressed by the world. Uh, let's just leave it at that. So, so, so just to follow up, the fight against oppression itself does not make you a leftist. Yeah. It's not reducible to what it means to be a leftist. I would, well, I guess, I mean, there's just something to be said for the the naivety of being young and, and bright eyed and bushy tailed. I, I meet a lot of students um, who are gung ho about what's going on. They think this is a moment of potential. And, and I don't want to have them collide with platypus and then become depressed and black pilled. That's not what I mean by the death of the left and, and feeling it, feeling the weight of it. I'm not trying to get people to give up on this ever being possible. I mean, I would rather they give up on this than just join the Democrats, but that's not the goal um, is for them to give up on this entirely. I'm, I'm comparing these bright eyed and bushy tailed young people like excited about the DSA or excited about Extinction Rebellion or, or whatever they're excited about. I'm comparing those people to some of the new leftists we interview for the PR who are over 70 years old and they'll give you like a wizened up account of, Oh, well, it was never going to work out in the seventies anyway. You know, we're smarter now we've, we've learned our lessons and, and, you know, here's why it didn't work out that kind of realism. Um, like, you know, we've, we, we, uh, we were defeated and now we know better. I'm not as much interested in that realism as I am the, utopianism of the youthful people today and what are they really hoping to achieve what do they think is possible what do they think the horizons for change really are and then you know hopefully i can get them to expand their imagination even more i can i can point to evidence in the past of the left thinking hey just an, a better you know kinder capitalism a, a, a bigger welfare state that's not the threshold of success that the left used to have. That was not synonymous with socialism. The New Deal was not what, meant, what was meant by socialism. Can we think bigger than that? I, I would like to have that conversation. And I find that easier to do with a lot of young people who are not quite set in their ways and don't think that you know they have everything figured out. Um, what, about, what about others? Well, just in terms <clears throat> of the struggle against oppression, quote unquote. I think it's, you know, it's important to recognize that again for Marxism, like the only point of the oppressed was they were politicized as such. As in like the working class was important because they formed a class. They thought that we as workers have some sort of um, common interest in this political goal of socialism. That's why socialism was really very little more than the movement of the working class. But absent that, there's not exactly a point in like 
you know, trying to affirm like the, the, as in like, what's the point of a labor union absent the struggle for socialism? It may be to earn people their, you know, their wages. It may be to get people better working conditions, but then the question has to be, in what way is that related to socialism? In what way is that related to any emancipatory goal? Or is it really just to secure people their bread? Which is, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's completely true. The question is, what is, what is the trajectory of that brought to its conclusion? In what ways does it politicize itself? And that's the question, not so much, you know, not just the status of the oppressed as such. But I did also want to bring up another question, um, just because I think it's pertinent to the topic of the teach-in, which is, I wanted to ask what people thought of what sounds like a very limited view of Plat like Platypus has a very narrow scope, which I think people become somewhat frustrated with. Like they want to do all this different stuff with Platypus that they, they kind of realize eventually someone says, well, why don't you just go do that? You don't need Platypus to do this or that. Like, I was wondering what you, I guess how people kind of think about like that kind of narrow, narrow scope that platypus allows itself. I mean, I don't see any um, problem with, with that. I think a lot of people actually do take issue with, with platypus in the sense that it's not activist enough or something like that. And I mean, it's not as if platypus would do everything by itself. Um, there's a division of labor um, across the left. And you're not like being forced to, <clears throat> you know, you're not being forced to like stay only in platypus at gunpoint or something. You can go out and you can join, another, you can join the DSA if you want. You can join, you know, other groups. Um, there's like, yeah, I mean, there's nothing really keeping you um, from doing any of that. Um, I think it's, it's kind of uh, nice actually that Platypus has, you know, a kind of narrow focus. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it might be too crude of me to put it this way, but I'll just give it a shot. Um, I think we we come into the leftist scene, we already find that theory and practice are separated quite distinctly. And so we just have to work with the, the circumstances we inherit. And I think platypus just can't do it all. We can't be the one that like ties them back together and, and, and uh, by ourselves. There's lots of work that platypus just can't do. We're not a political project but a lot of political work needs to be done. I mean, don't get me wrong. It, it would be good to organize community gardens and brake light clinics and um, uh, labor unions. The labor unions have to be one away from the Democrats if there's ever gonna be socialism. That's work that needs to be done. Platypus cannot do that. We, we only have a, a scarce amount of time and, and resources and we have a particular focus and that is the theoretical obstacles in the way of, of reconstituting the left. You know, those, there are a lot of uh, organizations that are engaged in things like that right now of, you know, there, there's the base building trend, uh, which I guess is still ongoing. Maybe it's just been less um, in, in the news. Um, you know, people were just like, we need to just start doing tenants unions for like decades, right? To build up some kind of base in that case. When these things have emerged, to me, they have um, revitalized uh, to me the uh, the departure point of platypus, meaning they're going to raise the same questions of platypus's starting point as it was. So for example, um, on our podcast recently, we had someone from a local Philadelphia uh, base building kind of project and immediately the question just came up, well, why isn't this just going to be organizing people for the Democrats later, right? And so again, it's not like I'm against people doing tenant, I'm not against people doing tenancy unions at all. That's, you know, no doubt plenty of landlords, you know, have plenty of predatory behavior and 
this is just like that's the, but the point is that this is just basic liberalism that civil society organizing people getting together you and your neighbors yeah i hope that you and your neighbors would rather you know protect each other in in times like right now or maybe uh or cooperate when you know people are unemployed all these things like you know but it's kind of like not platypus's point to be like that's a moral good or something like that yeah you don't need marxism for that that's just me danny jacobs saying you should be a good person not a terrible person okay so then the question to me is the narrow point of platypus that actually emphasizes the essential aspect it's the ideological barrier it's that something like this base building tendency right now this is not the first time it's happened this isn't the first time it's happened in the last 20 years. This is not the first time it's happened in the last 40, 60 years. This is something that kind of is constantly being like, okay, we need to like start over and just go from the beginning kind of thing. And that's because it's constantly liquidated into capitalist politics because basically without the political end, there is no place to go. And rationally, it makes sense to, well, if there's a local Democrat who's gonna help us out, you would be a fool not to agree with them, right? Because something like the end, like the end goal of socialism, that's not immediately rational. It's not. If the point is to protect people's shelter and get them food, uh, you know, your daydreaming, your utopianism, you know, this term, that might be a barrier to, you know, just right. Why are you going to spoil everything so that people can't put food on the table? And so actually, this is rather a way of bring, you know, these kinds of groups necessarily bring up these kinds of questions, in which case platypus is there to like raise, well, why is this the case? Why is it that when you get to like just the straightforward question of the, the political end of something that people are spontaneously doing, that it becomes a problem? And actually, you can imagine that the more political, the, the more active the left got, the more necessary platypus would be. It wouldn't render us like obsolete automatically. It would make us like more important because they would be raising those questions at a faster clip, maybe at a higher level of, of critical consciousness. And so platypus would be necessary to, to help that conversation go, go along. Um, okay, I lost what I was gonna say. Oh, well, never mind. Well, it, it actually as well in terms of platypuses, um, you know, all bets are off kind of thing. Members of platypus might in the future be involved in different political projects, right? That says something also, again, about how we're approaching these problems really via negativa in a negative sense. But, you know, I, you know, I like Ethan a lot, but we might be on the opposite side of the barricades. I don't know. Uh, we, no, we probably <laughs> yeah, will. We will be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, but that actually says something again about the pre-political character, meaning we're not pre-political in the sense of I'm trying to figure out my political theory and then departing. I'm saying I feel like politics, I feel like people even thinking about politics is so constrained. And that's why I brought up the Democrats, nothing but Democrats aspect. It's not that people vote for Democrats. It's that like that is almost the cage by which people think of what left and right means, period. And if you don't believe me, wait for 2024, right? If you already forgot about the last election, just wait for it once it's, you know, once something is on the, uh, on the block again. Well, I was going to allow for some more productive silence. Uh, somebody surely has another question. I guess to go to what Danny was saying about the barricades, just something that came to mind when he said that. I know it was kind of an offhand joke, but like, the point of platypus would be that that question could even possibly be raised, right? Like as in the question would be maybe we, 
how could we be politicized in such a way that actually we did have a substantive division? That maybe I could substantively have a disagreement with like Danny and that we would be members of a different socialist party that had, you know, respective followings among this or that movement, right? But like that question actually can't be posed now, which is that, which is, you know, this is a constant thing even within platypus, which is like, you know, what does it mean that we have like these like big disagreements even on the level of politics? But it's like, you know, I guess the point of me bringing up the narrow scope of platypus is like, actually, even those don't even matter. Like we still kind of find ourselves stuck in the same problem. Ethan, what was the, um, what was the original impetus of this teaching? Was this like, like what's this a product of? In my efforts to put old uh, archive.org material of platypus activity onto YouTube, I just came across a bunch of different events that uh, little tidbits here and there that where a platypus member had remarked on what the purpose of our organization was, that the slogans that I drew attention to, like how we're pre-political or um, what do we mean by the left is dead, long live the left. Or what do we mean when we say we're trying to turn a liability into an asset? Slogans like that, like I was started to come across. I'm like, oh, let me try to put this in my own words and um, and and see if I can explain it in the in the way that it made sense to me. I'm mm. hoping I'm hoping it helps more than just me. I'm hoping it helps pe whoever whoever listens to it um, when it goes up on YouTube. It seems like part of what you're what you're also kind of like looking to do with this, at least I get the impression um, that you're trying to like, kind of like uncover the affect, even though that word gets like abused a lot, like that kind of encourages um, platypus. Like you gave that description, like in your description, you say something like, um, there's, it's one thing to like, I think it's something like it's like one thing to like think the whole like shtick, but it's another to actually like feel it. Was it mean to like feel uh, this like counter revolution? Um, something that came to my mind when I was like thinking about this topic is like often when I like learn something, you kind of like learn it twice or sometimes like more than twice in the sense that you like learn it on like a like a level of thought and you're like, oh, okay, so such and such is the case. But then later on, you get like, you you really like feel it. Like you're like, oh, that's the case or whatever. Um, and a lot of, I, I feel like all the slogans that people like to throw around in platypus are like, those like are all very, they all have like a tendency to give that like experience where you can like, maybe you can easily accept it, but then like it really hits you later on on that like second level i don't know i, I joke until you make it yeah i was just gonna say that i jokingly charted out all the the phases a platypus member might go through i did this a couple of years ago and one of the earliest phases you go through is fuck this organization i hate it um you know everything they say is wrong why would they ever dare call the left dead you go through this period of like total rejection and then you eventually come to terms with, hey, I think the left actually is in a pretty low state and, and, and all the things they claim to be upholding, they're really not. Um, they're actually an anti-left. You come to terms with that, but, but you don't know how to put it into your own words. So that you go through this phase of just repeating Chris Coutrone thought or something like that. You, you repeat everything you hear other Platypus members say but it hasn't really hit you at the level of your own words yet. You're just repeating the thoughts. Um, That's why you have to teach platypus. You do, you have to teach it and, and putting it into your own words takes time. I, I'm gonna be honest, um, took me three-ish years going through the same readings several times before I ever understood what the authors were saying. And having been separated from some of the legs of the tripod. I'm not doing the reading group this semester. I'm just doing coffee breaks and panels. 
I'm already feeling like I need to relearn this stuff. I'm, I'm feeling like I re need to re-explain the basics to myself. Um, and, and again, put it into my own thoughts and my own words. You do have to fake it until you make it often. And then once you make it, you might unmake it again. <laughs> you, you have to go back to it um, and really internalize it. I mean, there's something also in platypus like uh, developing a, I wanna say thick skin, but I know that has a very specific meaning, like one that can, you have thick skin, you can take criticism, but that's not really what I mean. What I mean is kind of against reality itself that you can try to kind of be like, well, A, it's harrowing to think maybe there is no left. That's not an easy, comfortable thing because maybe someone will accept, uh, thank you, because uh, maybe one will accept like, yeah, those people over there suck, but at least I know what the real shit is. So yeah. it's much more harrowing to, to kind of feel lost. Um, in, in that sense. And then two, you know, just there's the experience of there are surprises that, that happen, that things that come out of nowhere and you go like, oh, I mean, the Trump phenomenon was like a surprise. It was like, oh, OK, I guess this is something now. No, we, I can find other examples as well. And so it's one of these things of also trying to inculcate certain ways of intuiting or thinking or approaching something, it doesn't mean you're gonna have the right answer, but that, you know, creating, I even wanna put it as simple as creating good habits. I know that sounds kind of vulgar when I put it as habits, but it, it is like, um, you know, one of the things I find that's a problem with the left is they give bad habits to people about thinking about things. So what happens is like, as soon as, I don't know, there were, there were riots last summer, okay? Maybe I was even sympathetic with it, where yeah, I don't think it's a good thing to watch somebody get strangled in the street by police officers. Obviously, it's, it's harrowing. But like, I was surprised to see so many people who I thought ought to have known better to be like, this is a revolution. Yeah, you know, now I see everybody with their eyebrows looking at me because it's like, we're in March and it's like, well, what did that lead? You know, Biden, that didn't lead to a revolution. But my, my point being that like, you have to kind of build up that way to kind of soberly, you know, receive history as it's happening. And that's something that kind of has to be taught. And you have to kind of be willing to treat yourself as an object and kind of critically put yourself up and be transparent about um, your own baggage in that sense. Not that this is like self-help in some kind of psychological sense, but it's self-help in the historical sense that we all are members of society. We're all born into this history, right? Humans make history, but not out of their own, you know, not out of full cloth. This is the Marx phrase. And so all of us bear this, right? This isn't supposed to be malism, self-criticism. It's just supposed to be like, okay, you know, kind of self-reflexivity. And so therefore, I am willing to treat myself as, uh, bye, thank you. Um, you know, treat myself as as an object and kind of, I don't know, there is something about platypus that it's like, you you have to kind of be willing to be like, all right, I, I'm gonna go down that road with <laughs> at times, yeah. Well, that's why yeah. I put the little blurb in, in my remarks about how um, you might think you have solid footing in your understanding of both historical Marxism and of the project itself. But every time the, the left reacts to a change in capitalist politics, all that solid footing might mount out from under you. There were a lot of people who were very good, very productive, very dedicated members of Platypus that were blindsided by Trump as a phenomenon. And they decided to sort of distance themselves from the project. And, and maybe they didn't want to hear, you know, what Platypus had to say during that period a lot of them are coming back now and and they're having to learn those lessons a few years later than the the ones who stuck around learned them but there um no amount of habit setting can guarantee that you know you'll react perfectly to to the changes that the left undergoes but we are trying to give people a sensibility about how to be a little bit more sober when these things happen I mean, I think part of what Ethan has also brought up, and so I guess 
um, we can talk about this. And this reminds me of something what Clay said a, a few minutes ago. Now platypus has a history, right? So platypus is founded in 2006. I, I guess formally, you can say it's prior to that. Um, and so now we've had generations a strong word, but we've had different phases on the left by which people have been recruited in or have encountered platypus and then joined later like myself. And those breaks in history aren't always experienced in a comfortable fashion. They're sharp. And so consequently, one may be recruited into platypus at one time and then something changes and that makes the starting point look no longer, uh, it, it can look like a betrayal even. And be like, oh, this is like an opposite thing. So, you know, using platypus also as an objectification of history by which one can work on themselves, can self-educate. And part of the self-education is, is actually trying to teach platypus to others because the best way to learn something is to teach it because it's kind of like the sink or swim. It's the jumping in the fire. You know, you're in a room in front of 10, 18 year olds and they're like, so what's platypus? You can't be like, it's an animal, bye. Um, yeah, teaching's great. And that's how you can feel it, going back to the point of this teacher. That's how you can feel the regression. That's gonna highlight it. It's actually gonna be teaching things and then how people respond to it that you're gonna sort of gather for yourself or start to infer where certain ideological obstacles are. You can you can try to go along. Oh, there's a little bit of sorry, Danny's feedback. Um, that you can try to go along and just passively receive it for a time. You can listen to other platypus members tell you how dead the left is, but that that only can take you so far. And eventually, you have to actively teach this stuff yourself. You have to explain it to new people and explain to them why the why the left is dead, what that really means, and um, and you, you got to do it a few times, really. And it's also, it even clarifies to yourself if you believe it, because maybe you don't, in which case yeah. it's going to come out when you try to teach it and people are going to pick up on your ambivalence. And that's fine. It's not, I'm not mad at people if they don't agree with this. It's just like, one should be clear. We, we did meet students at George Mason who were very good um, students in the reading group they did the readings they did presentations on the readings and then they got through the syllabus and then they're like if this was marxism i'm not really interested in it actually and that was a good admission that was i'm glad that they were honest with themselves and us they said this is not for me i would rather that happen than people like feign a, a pseudo marxism for for the rest of their life and still be reading um you know trotsky's uh uh permanent revolution, you know, on their deathbed and, and thinking, oh, you know, I've read it one more time and then I'll, I'll be able to make the revolution. Oh, bye, Mike. I don't, um, I don't have much else to add. I, I'm happy to stop the recording if, if anyone doesn't have any more questions. Well, before we go, um, or before I stop the recording, we don't have to go. I, you know, you can shoot the shit with me for a little bit before I go get dinner. Um, I did want to advertise our local activity. Uh, so in Virginia, we do coffee breaks weekly at this time, mostly. Usually Wednesdays is when we do them from 5.30 or 6 to, you know, whenever we get tired of hearing each other. And coffee breaks are great for going through the Platypus Review, talking about current events, whatever's on your mind that, you know, some, some crazy thing like Mr. Potato Head being banned, you know, whatever you want to talk about, Syria being bombed, um, you know, we can talk about that. Very informal. Sundays, we do the reading group. More rigorous, disciplined, more formal. We go through a syllabus and we are, um, we're in uh, the, I'd say the, the first half of the syllabus right now of revolutionary Marxism, where we're going through figures like Lenin and Luxembourg and Trotsky. 
and eventually we'll make our way to Frankfurt School people like Adorno and Horkheimer and Benjamin. Um, and that's all what we do during the spring. We'll have a different syllabus for the summer and then yet another one for the fall. Um, it goes in cycles. Um, so if any of that interests you or all of it interests you, please, please attend. Uh, more than welcome and bring a friend. Uh, you know, don't go to these things alone. Uh, ruin someone else's uh, afternoon sometime too. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'm going to stop the recording now and uh, I want to thank you all for, for attending. <laughs>